Hi everybody and welcome to the channel. I am Richard. Today I'm gonna take on my little pirate patch again and take you out on the seas because I'm gonna show you Oak and Iron. This is an historical naval battle game. It's about you being a pirate captain of your ship or your fleet and you're going to try to take down the other ships or maybe capture them. Take them and get them to become yours. This game can be played in a bunch of different ways. I'm going to show you the a little bit more advanced setup here, but you could skip some of the setting cards and the event cards here that I'm going to show you today. So I'm going to show you the setup of this game. I'm going to show you an overview of this game. I'm going to show go through some of the rules. So let's just take a look at it. This is the setup of the game. It has a great table presence, right? Out here we have all the tokens that I'm going to show you later. Here we have the measuring stick to see the distance from the boat. Here we got the movement sticks. There are five of those in different sizes. We have some event cards here. I'm going to show you them later as well. We have a bunch of upgrade cards here to upgrade your ship. Each player have taken five initiative cards looking like that four of these reload markers, two of the wave markers. They have taken two ship cards, assigned one admiral to one of the ships, making that ship their flagship. And then they have taken two ships corresponding to their cards. At the start of each game, each player also get three fortune points. Before we start the game, we need to do some settings. If you would do a basic game, there wouldn't be any settings because you would just need to just get a grip of the actual combat. But we are going to place out some terrain on the board as well. First thing we need to do is to draw one of the objective cards looking like this. These will give the players different kind of objectives that they will need to resolve during their gameplay. And then we need to draw three of the setting cards looking like this. These setting cards will give you different kind of terrains out on the playing fields and the terrain can look in a bunch of different ways. Then we also need to take three of the deployment cards looking like this. These cards will determine where you should put your ships. Then we need to take three of the advantages and condition cards looking like this. Now we need to check our cards to see who has the highest admiral value. The player with the highest value will decide if they want to be the attacker or the defender. If they have the same value, they should do a challenge test. The one that wins the test gets to decide if they want to be the attacker or the defender. Once this is done, each player should draw one of these cards. When every player have one of these cards in their hand, the rest of them are discarded. The setting cards will tell you how many terrain pieces to put into the terrain pool. Now that we have checked the setting cards, we have a full pool of terrain pieces. Starting with the defending player, we should start to take turns to place out terrain on the map itself. So first the defender puts out a little island and then the attacker puts out some rocks. It goes back to the defender again, he puts out another island, and so on, until all the terrain have been placed on the map. Now that we have placed out all the terrain on the map, it's time for us to take a look at our deployment cards. These cards will tell us where on the map we have our deployment zone. And if there is any rock or other terrain within our zone, this is our chance to take the measuring stick and move that island away. We can move any island or rock or whatever it is within the distance of a pistol shot. Depending on what kind of deployment cards you get, you will end up on different sides of the map, of course. So this one, for example, you will end up on the lower half of the map. And on this one, you will end up on the left side of the map. No player may place any of their ship within cannon distance to the opponent. So now it's time for us to also read the objective of this game, our mission, so to say. And it's important to read this during setup because this might affect where you should place your ship. This might affect what you will actually try to reach during your gameplay and so on. 
So now it's time for us to actually start playing the game. The first phase here is the initiative phase. The first thing every player should do is to draw one of their initiative cards. At the end of your initiative phase, you choose a new card that you would like to play at the next initiative phase. But as this is the first round, we just have to choose one of the cards that we picked up from the deployment. If the player draws the same initiative number, we need to draw an event card, looking like this. And then we need to solve this event. These events can affect the game in a bunch of different ways. This one, for example, treat all range outside of yard arms as one range farther for the rest of the turn. So this one will affect your game pretty much because you can't see that good when you're going to shoot your opponent. Once we have read the event or solved the event, the admiral with the highest admiral points, this one up here, is the one that has the initiative. If there is a tie, again, we will have to do a challenge. To do a challenge test, we need to roll some die. The player that gets the most ships and or skulls is the winner. If there is a tie, the flagship, the one with an admiral attached to it, with the highest skill is the winner. If both ships have the same skill value, you just keep on rolling until one wins. The challenge is over and we now know who has the initiative. These cards should be placed face up on the player boards for each player to see the effects that these initiative cards have during this round. Now we also need to choose a new initiative card for the next round, but we will first show them at the start of next round. In the movement phase, we get to move our boats around. But we need to check how the wind is blowing, because this affects your movements quite a lot. There are three different ways that your ship can be in the wind. You can be sailing large, which means that your stern, the back of the ship, is closer to the weather edge than your front, the bow. And you can be sailing windward, meaning that your bow is closer to the weather edge than your stern. And you can be in the wind's eye, meaning that your bow is closer than 45 degrees of the weather's edge. So for example, if your ship is like this, and this angle, and this angle here, is closer to the weather edge than your stern, you are in the wind's eye. But if your side is closer and your front is further away, you are not in the wind's eye. Once we have figured out if we are sailing against the wind or with the wind in our back or in the side or whatever, we need to look at our card, our ship's card, to determine the speed. For example, you have a number three if you are sailing large with the wind in the back. If you have it from the side, you have a speed of 2. And to see how far you can move with 3, for example, you need to look at the movement tools. This one has a number 3 on it, meaning that you can move your ship this distance. Before we move our boats, we have the opportunity to do some settings on them. We can adjust the sails, we can adjust the speed, and we can also turn them. But to be able to do these sea man actions, we need to do some skill test. We need to roll five die. If we get any skulls or boats, the test was successful and we are able to do one of the following. We can adjust the speed of the boat by adjusting the sails. This one here, for example, is full sail and will give this ship one more movement. So if it had three to start with, it will now have four. Or we can lower the sails, making it move one step slower. When it has no token on them, it is set in on the basic settings of your card. If your ship is not in the wind's eye, entangled, anchored, or in any way stuck, you can choose to turn by using the number one movement tool, simply twisting your ship along the sides. 
or you could use the seaman action to cut free. If you are entangled with another ship, you can move one yard arm away from that ship, putting this stick next to the ship and moving it directly away. Now this ship's sail setting goes back to as it was before and you can move but only one speed. Once we're done with the seaman actions, we are down to the movement phase. This is where we actually get to move our cool little boat around in the ocean. We have a full sail on this boat. We are sailing large as we have our back of the boat closest to the wind. So we have a speed of four. So I should use this speed tool right here with a four on it. I should put it, put it in the front of the boat, move the boat alongside the arrow all the way up to this part right here. So when your back hits this arrow here, you have done your movement. Once we're done with the movement, we move into the crew actions. Here you can choose one of eight different crew actions. The first one is to reload. Here you can choose to simply just remove the reload token from your ship and make it ready to fire again. Or you could choose to rally. If you choose to rally, you simply lower the fatigue of your ship and making it in just a little bit better shape. Or you could try to move an aground token, but then you would need to do a skill test. If the skill is successful, the token is removed. If it's not successful, well, you're still stuck. You can change the sails up or down. If you are within one yard arm of another ship, you could try to board it. To board it, you need to do a skill test. If the skill is successful, you get to move your ship up by the other boat. These ships are now entangled. If you have the sweeps special upgrade, you could choose to row and move one step. Or why not make one of your other friendly ships your flagship? If you are in within pistol shot range of one of your friendly ships, you can change the admiral to that ship instead if it's not entangled. If a ship is anchored within pistol shot from an island and not shaking, you might put a landing party on the island close by. Once done with the crew actions, we move into the attack phase. And here, each ship can shoot one time per side, meaning that this ship could shoot once on the one over here and another one over here. And you can fire as long as you are in within cannon range or less. So if you are within pistol range, you can choose to shoot with a pistol. And when you roll your dice, you get a skull, cannon, musket or pistol. You have a hit. So the closer you are, the bigger chance of a hit you have. And the further away you go, the harder it will be for you to actually hit your target. And then it's time to check if you have done any critical damage. If you have rolled a skull, you will get an extra die for every skull you have rolled to try to do additional critical damage. And by this roll, if you do a skull or a ship or a sable, the opponent have taken critical damage. Once you have taken your shot, you need to put a reload marker on the side you have fired from. What I just showed you was a broadside attack, meaning that we shot from the broadside. But you can also shoot from the front or the back, for example. But you would need to be within musket range. And even if you have a reload marker on your boat, you can still fire this. You just need to be in line of sight and within the musket range. The last attack action is close combat. If you are entangled with another ship, or have a landing party on the same island as an opponent, you can do close combat. You should roll five die, plus the number that you have crewman value on your boat. The attack phase is now done, and we move into the end phase. Again, we have a bunch of cool options. The first one is to capture or destroy a ship. If you are entangled with a ship where the crew has been shaken, you can either choose to capture this ship and make it yours, or destroy it and watch it sink down to the bottom of the ocean. Step two in the end phase is to check for withdrawals, 
meaning that some of your men might want to flee and stop being a part of your crew. So we need to count the strike points that we have received during this round. For each ship that is crippled, you get one strike point. For each ship that is sunken or captured, you get two strike points. If your flagship is out of action, meaning that it's both crippled and shaken, you get three strike points. If you get more strike points than you have ships, well, you have lost. If there's a tie, keep on playing. And then we need to roll one die for each ship that is out of actions. If we get a boat or a skull, this boat will sink down to the bottom of the ocean. If a player have lost one of their flagships and also lost an admiral, this is where they have a chance to use one of their fortune points to change the flagship. If they do not do this or can't do this for any reason, a new ship needs to be assigned with an admiral of the value of zero. Both players now take their initiative cards that they have used during this round and put it into their hand again. If nobody had won, it's time for a new round. This is the way the game goes on turn after turn until eventually one player runs out of ships or you hit round number 10. And at the end of number 10, the player who has the least amount of strike points is the winner. And if there is a tie, the defender is declared the winner, but just barely. So there you have it, people. That was Oak and Iron for you. A cool historical naval battle game. There's a lot of small rules in this game and there's a lot of things that you can or cannot do here. So it's a good thing to study the rules a little bit before you actually start playing. But once you have gotten the hand of the rules and you understand the gameplay, this game is a lot of fun. It's a player versus player game where you just try to take out the other player's boat or take over their boat and get to own them in your fleet. It's a really, really cool game. And there's a lot of things to think about in this game. If you should have the right speed, you should lower the sails. Should you anchor your ships? Which, which direction are you hitting the other ships in? This is a really, really cool strategical game. I really like this one a lot. There will be links down in the description here to file out games and Oak and Iron. So check that out if you want to see more about the game. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. Throw in a comment there what you thought about the game, what you thought about the video. I love to have a conversation with you. If you like what I'm doing and if you like my channel, please subscribe to it and hang around to see what else I'm going to do in the future. And until next week, people, please keep on spreading that board gaming love that I know you all have. Peace out. Thank you.